Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things in retro and intervascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. This is Aaron Fritz as your host this week. I'm very excited to introduce my good friend and co host, Chris Beck, to the show. Welcome, Chris. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Aaron. Sure. Um, a- another low hanging fruit, bread and butter topic that you and I love to talk about. But I, I honestly, I think a lot of people get a lot out of these um, episodes. So let's jump right into it. We are going to talk about cholecystostomy tubes, um, wh- how they're placed, why they're placed, where they come from, um, differences in technique. So um, first off, Chris, everybody I think knows who you are, but you know, just a quick intro about yourself. Sure. I am uh, Chris Beck, interventional radiologist, private practice based out of New Orleans. Uh, work a lot in southern Louisiana, but primarily at New Orleans and um, also back table host playing great. guest. Yeah. Great, great. And everybody probably knows uh, I'm also an interventional radiologist in private practice here in Dallas, Texas. Um, so first question is, uh, where do these referrals usually come from for you, Chris? Surgery, almost exclusively for surgeons. Right. Usually it's because the surgeon doesn't, you know, the patient's high risk. They don't want to take them for cholecystectomy. Um, I rarely, I mean, sometimes it might come from the ED via the, you know, via the, ED, you know, the surgeon via the ED doc, that sort of thing. But usually it's the surgeon who's making the call. Hey, ask IR to, to put the, this in, right? Yes. Um, I mean, a lot of times, like in, in some super sick patients that are coming to the ICU, it's come a kind of a, um, a multidisciplinary approach. But I would say at some point there's been a surgeon encounter on someone I'm placing a coli tube on um, for our practice. I, I would venture to say 100 percent of the time. That's true. Yeah. A lot of the ones that I would get in the middle of the night a lot of times came from the ICU doc. Um, but I think that's after they had a conversation with the surgeon. Um, that basically said the guy's too sick to go to surgery. Um, Are you placing these in the middle in the middle of the night? I have, yeah, I've had to. Yeah, well, not not anymore, as you know. I don't take call, but <laughs> sure, sure. But just a part but, of your practice, like that wasn't like an I uncommon did. consult, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, for sure. I, I would mean, say I've, I've I would say I've never been called in the middle of the night to place one. It's always been like, oh, we'll do it first thing in the morning, kind of thing. Um, one, I, I can, I can just honestly say that like no one's ever called me like as an, as the on-call doc to come in and place one in the middle of the night. Um, yeah. I'm almost positive. I would, I mean, I never say 100% of the time, you know, if the patient's sick enough. I'll get out of bed, go see the patient uh, and depending on the situation, probably recommend that they could wait until the morning. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, I don't know. There's been, a, I, I've, I remember having that conversation with one ICU doc in particular who was like, look, this guy's really sick. You know, um, I don't remember if they were on pressors or anything, but they had some hypotensive episodes. They were, they seemed to be, you know, in sepsis. So that's what pushed me to go in and put it in kind of like a nef tube, you know? Sure. Um, yeah. And I, I can envision a world, uh, where, where like there's, there's <laughs> patients that would warrant that. I, yeah. I guess, um, you know, very possibly my acuity level, like in, in some of the hospitals I work at is lower or, you know, the ICU docs uh, tolerance for um, sepsis is maybe a little bit higher. But a lot of times we continue to cool them off with antibiotics and then place it like next available slot. Like I would say not emergently, but urgently. Yeah. Yeah. Either way. Yeah. It's it's emergent or, 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 or urgent for sure. Um, yeah. Do you usually have CT or ultrasound imaging ahead of time? And if, if you didn't, would, I mean, let's say they came from an outside hospital, what would you, what do you usually like need in terms of imaging? Yeah, I would say that, you know, they, they come to me at various levels of, of being like fully baked versus like completely not worked up at all. And the surgeon just kind of like eyeballed them and said, like, not a surgical candidate. I don't know if they have cholecystitis, but like, it doesn't matter to me because I wouldn't take out the gallbladder. And, and then it kind of gets uh, put in my lap. Um, I would say always I'll go see the patient, um, and do an assessment, look at any prior imaging. I, I will go off, uh, ultrasound if like, I think it's rip roaring cholecystitis, uh, if it's equivocal, um, may or may not get a HIDA scan, a CT. I'll only have a, if I have a CT because, you know, they had one out of the ER or somebody ordered one happy to like use CT, but, um, ultrasound and HIDAs are what like I would, uh, be ordering. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So one of those three typically ultrasound, HIDA and or CT, but 
a lot of times, like you said, it's usually just a high dead and an ultrasound. Yeah, definitely going to get an ultrasound. Like if for yeah. some reason they hadn't had an ultrasound, I would definitely get an ultrasound, even if they'd had a CT. Well, I don't right. want to say all, like, I mean, that's not 100%. Sometimes you can look at it and say, okay, that's cholecystitis. Um, yeah. But almost always I'll have an ultrasound and plus or minus on the HIDA. Yeah, great. HIDAs are kind of a mixed bag, right? I mean, a lot yeah. of false positives in HIDAs, but, you know, sometimes it's helpful. Like if you happen to get a HIDA that shows a patent cystic duct, then you're kind of off the hook. Yeah. Any labs you're making sure you got, like coags? Yeah, I definitely do coags, make sure the patients aren't on any anticoagulation. And not that that's a, a contraindication, but um, it helps me, uh, you know, it's a relative contraindication, certainly helps me stratify my risk and uh, right. counsel either the patient or family members appropriately. So I have uh, PT, INR, platelets, and I'm trying to think of what else. That's probably it. I can't think of it. Nothing else jumps out. So just real quick, we're going to get to this in terms of our, our preferred technique, but if let's say they were as an old person who's like septic, but they've been on Plavix, would that make you de like decide, I probably won't go through the liver on this one. I'll probably go around it if possible when placing the tube. Yes. Um, so I don't, I don't feel strongly about going transhepatic one way or the other, like all, all things being equal, I will go transhepatic. Um, but if they were on, uh, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, or, or just say Plavix, I would probably uh, go just transperitoneal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a, a lot of times the anatomy dictates it for me. I mean, like, I just don't, I just don't kill myself to make it transhepatic when, you know, the anatomy showing something different right. and uh, vice versa. Yeah. Just kind of shortest pathway, safest pathway. Shortest, right safest into... pathway yeah. and, you know, well below, like preferably, um, you know, subcostal instead of intercostal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And just like being cognizant of where you like if you're it's OK to go intercostal, just being cognizant of like how high you are and like your potential right. of transplural uh, transgression. Right. Similar to putting in a biliary drain, just making sure that. Exactly. I mean, sometimes the liver's way up under the, especially if they have shallow breathing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you have them supine, the liver can be way up under the rib cage. And you sometimes, you, yeah, you have to go intercostal, but then like, yeah, count the ribs, make sure you're not going through the plural pearl space, right? Right, 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 right. Um, well, cool. So uh, we kind of covered stick through the liver or not. I mean, I, I feel the same way. It just depends on the anatomy. Um, I would say that if the anatomy could go either way and they're on um, uh, anticoagulation, and also depending on what anticoagulation it is, but like something I would consider, I would say, you know, dual antiplatelet therapy or, you know, uh, INR is like, you know, three I would, I would stay transperitoneal and avoid the liver. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's just for our audience to know what, what are the pros and cons of going to the liver or not going to the liver? Well, how do you feel about it? Like, well, so the, what, what I was told when, um, you know, sometimes something would look like a, a chip shot going around the, the liver, not through the liver, uh, transperitoneal is well, that can cause a biliary leak. And the reason for going through the liver is because you're, you're going through an area where that gallbladder is facing the liver. So it's, you're not going to, you're much less likely to have a biliary leak if you put that tube through the liver into the gallbladder. That makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. And th that's what we were taught also. But I guess I've, I've done a lot of cholecystostomy tubes and I've been transperitoneal a lot of times and yeah. haven't had a lot, of, you know, knock on wood, right. haven't had a lot of leaks. Um, also, I, I think it matters where... So a lot of times the gallbladders are massively distended in these patients. And if you're like sticking the gallbladder when it's really, really distended and you're like having a really, really low stick, I think that also like matters. I try and anticipate like what the gallbladder would look like if it was decompressed. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that when it gets decompressed, it's not like the tube's going to pull out. Right. Or be half sticking, you know, we've all seen those tube checks where the tube's like half pulled out. Half pulled out, yeah. Right. And there might be, like you said, like once it's decompressed, it kind of sucks up under the liver and then your tube's sitting in a fixed place and and it almost pulls out on its own, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I could see that happening. But yeah, the, going through the liver to me was just like to help prevent biliary leak, uh, especially if you had like an issue getting the initial tube in because that, that that gallbladder can be kind of floppy, right? Yes. Uh, it can be all kind of rubbery and floppy. And if you don't get a good, if you don't pin it, then um, you might not be able to get that tube to pass through it. And so the liver actually, if you go through the liver, it kind of helps 
it's again, it's that, that area where it's affixed to the liver and it helps almost pin it to get that tube going smoothly. I totally agree. I think the gallbladder, and, and that's one of the reasons I like doing it under ultrasound rather than CT. Um, it's a pretty dynamic organ. It, it's, you know, sticking, it's like sticking sometimes a, a decompressed bag. Yeah. Um, and I, I feel like there's a lot less play in the gallbladder as far as it like kind of just continuing to tint, tint, tint if you're right. transhepatic. So totally agree on that. Yeah. So let's talk about, um, you know, CT versus ultrasound slash fluoro for these. Um, I've seen people doing them both ways. What's, what's your technique uh, using imaging? Ultrasound and fluoro always. Yeah. And I say always with the caveat being sometimes you can't have it that way for whatever reason. Um, like different hospitals have, you have, you have different resources and available right. to you at different hospitals. So, you know, I don't want to fault anyone who, who likes to do it under CT or, you know, likes to do it with exclusively ultrasound. But I have my druthers, every th- um, closest ostomy tubes with combination of ultrasound and fluoro, and, like, you know, in a cath lab setting. Yeah, it's good to bo- know both ways. I definitely prefer ultrasound fluoro because I like sticking it under real time, in real time, under ultrasound mm-hmm. and watching my, even watching my wire coil within right. it under, under real time. Because like I said, when it gets all rubbery and tough and it's all inflamed, it can push away and, and you can end up even shearing the side of the gallbladder wall because you're, you know, it's not like like sticking an abscess where it goes in and it, it usually will go in smoothly. It's, it's all thick wool. And so what can happen is you can actually really get outside. You can, you, you can, you can really mess up the gallbladder wall if, if you don't, you know, stick it dead on. And that's why I like to seal it in real, uh, in, in real time. That being said, CT is helpful at times when maybe you don't have ideal ultrasound, um, access maybe maybe like we said the gallbladder is way up under the rib cage you don't have great visualization with ultrasound um maybe that uh you know the the floor room is being taken up by a uh a stat STEMI or something like that and and you you have to do under ct one of the guys i know in my in my old group he likes it under ct he says look it's to me it's just like sticking an abscess um and and so that's why he does it under ct he feels like it's faster that way I mean, if, it, you know, if, if that, if that, uh, radiologist or interventionalist, if it's, if it's faster and safer for them, then, you know, I, I wouldn't argue that, but yeah. you know, for me, it's definitely faster, definitely safer with ultrasound and fluoro for, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, first it's the dynamic area. Like if you just think about how much the liver will move with respirations, especially if you have like some of those ICU patients who are just like doing like big, deep belly breathing. Yeah, I mean, like you're, I mean, it's almost like your ultra, your um, gallbladder can come in and out of focus, and like you're just waiting for it to like pop back into your window before you stick it. Um, and it is like an abscess, but I think there are some differences. And and one of the things that you mentioned was that a lot of times the gallbladder wall can be more friable, and you know, as opposed to like a well formed abscess wall, which they're not right. all like that, but. It's um, almost like a half-baked abscess in that if you're not careful, if you don't have pretty good wire discipline and also like dilating, I think it is easy to uh, push through. Or if you're if you're not like pinning your wire very well, like with the dilators or even when you're going on like with a stiff, uh, like a stiff metallic uh, yeah. or an inner stiffener that's metallic, I think you can push through the gallbladder wall. And I think we've actually talked about that before where like I've done gallbladder cases where you know, I'm dilating up and then I go to put the tube in or, or like I'm adding a little bit more wire and it's just not tracking along the gallbladder lumen like I thought it was. Yeah. And I've, I've been out and like I've pushed through and through or at some point like somehow lost access. And I think in the cases that I can remember, it was because like I was just not like very disciplined with the wire. And I think I continue to push through it with the dilator. Yeah. Yeah. The dil- yeah, uh, dilating is key uh, because like, a, like we talked about that wall is very rubbery. And, um, and if you don't, if you don't dilate appropriately, you're not going to be able to get your eight or 10 French tube in, um, and we'll get to size preference, but yeah, I think that adequate dilatation and, and also just speed and efficiency in in what you're doing, not dicking around, waiting for somebody to load it on. It's like, you got to have everything ready to go. Um, cause a lot of times it's super painful once you get that dilator in and it, you know, I don't, I do it with moderate station, but these guys can be like writhing in pain when you're dilating, right? Because it's so tender. 
Uh, and so that's why I think that uh, you have to have everything ready to go to just boom, 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 dilate, get the tube in and, and shoot and be done, you know, but sorry, you were going to say something. Well, I totally agree. And also whenever you like having everything ready to go, I mean, that's like IR 101. And as you go through enough cath labs, you'll, you'll learn that you just can't trust every, uh, team that you're working with, but having like each dilator set, ready to go, having the appropriately sized tube, because one of the things you really do not want to do is like, you know, put the 10 French tube, uh, the dilator in, take out the 10 French. And then you're like, all right, give me the, give me the, uh, the tube. And a lot of times, like with my cath lab, they get mixed up. They always want to hand me like a biliary drain, which is like mm -hmm. an internal external drain. Cause that's what right. it says. Right. And so that happens a lot. And so I'm like, give me the tube. And you know, as soon as I see it, I'm like, no wrong tube. Give me the tube that oh, looks gosh. like an nephrostomy tube. Yeah. And so, and you know, honestly, you know, that's not the situation where you just want to let the wire sit there and dangle in the patient. You want to go yeah. and like, you know, keep the the bile from leaking back either into the peritoneal right. cavity or along your track. And so, you know, put the dilator in, wait on them to get the tube, the correct tube. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, because you're right. Bile could just be pouring out. If yes. You're, if, especially if you go the peritoneal route. Yeah. Um, and that you can cause that. an abscess, right? I mean, if it's infected bile, it could, you could cause, uh, you know, an intraperitoneal abscess. So, um all right, well, let's back up for a sec. When you're sticking under ultrasound, what do you prefer, UE or AccuStick? Um, I don't use either. I'll usually or use a, well, I'll use a, a stick almost everything with a 20 gauge spinal needle. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And then you what just do, you do um, I like, I have done both. I, a lot of times when we're setting up the tech will hit me like an AccuStick needle and I just, I'm like, give me a UE. I just want to, um, because I, I don't like the whole process. I don't think it's necessary. I think, A, I can see the UE better under ultrasound. Um, For sure. And to me, it's just like, in that sense, it's just like sticking an abscess. So whether I'm going through the liver or around the liver, I, I can see my needle clearly under, my UE needle clearly under ultrasound, get it right where I want it to. I can take a nice clean picture uh, of it in the middle of that gallbladder lumen. And then I'm passing an 035 wire right away, right? I'm putting my... Yeah, yeah amplats or whatever right away. And so that to me, it just saves steps. That way I don't have to do the micro wire and then, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then the dilator, it, it's just an extra step of dilatation, I think. No, I, th I think that's very reasonable. What about, I mean, have you ever heard the argument that, you know, you should, you don't want to be sticking through solid organs, like either liver or kidney with like basically like a hollow needle, like the UE, the, your UE doesn't have an inner stylet, does it? It doesn't, but I, I've never... I've never heard that. Um, Some people will say that. I, I don't think it makes any difference. Like, I wouldn't have any problem going in with a UE. Um, but that's why a lot of people won't do UEs for, like, nephrostomy tubes either. Hmm. Like, if you know, if you had a big dilated system, you probably wouldn't use a UE. Or a lot of people wouldn't. Like, you just go micro. Like, that's true. Set or um, that's true. But I, I have heard of people sticking big dilated collecting systems with 18-gauge needles just from the get-go. Yeah. Um, I would probably... I like, I like using an 18 gauge needle also I like that. Yeah. I, I think it's one of those things like a, I think it's like one of those things like a, it's a, it's a risk that's kind of out there in the ether that someone brought up one time, but I don't think right. it comes up very often in practice. I'm sure someone out there, like if an audience member, please write us in tell us when you stuck something like yeah. transhepatic and like you ended up with some kind of complication. I'd like to know. Well, you know, it's the inferior tip of the right hepatic lobe. So the vessels are going to be small down there anyway. So I, I don't know if I'd be worried about bleeding or, you know, I guess that was, that's all you would really worry about, right? It's just. Yeah, just bleed bleed or pseudo yeah. or something. And I also wouldn't worry about it. Um, yeah. But uh, I use uh, a 20 gauge needle only because I, I just use, I almost stick everything with a 20 gauge needle. I don't like the Aki six sets. Um, for yeah. ours, the, the needle's always 15 centimeters, which yeah, rarely I need. Oh, right. It's way too long for a cholecystostomy yeah. tube. Um, and so I like the 20 gauge needle. And I do like getting the uh, Aki stick set. Like if I use uh, the 20 gauge needle, it, it's few and far, but I will say if there's like kind of an equivocal patient and I am sticking the, and, and we should probably talk about this. Whenever you stick the gallbladder and inject contrast, are you just filling them enough to know that you're in the lumen of the gallbladder or are you actually getting a cholangiogram? Like, you know, if you have a, like to see the cystic duct or potentially no, not see the cystic duct. Yeah. I mean, they're sick. So I'm just shooting enough to prove that I'm in the gallbladder. Okay. Um, so two two ways I'm confirming. One is that I'm, uh, you know, I'm injecting, or so I'm seeing visuals, I'm seeing that needle tip right in the middle of the lumen on my ultrasound image. And then as soon as I inject, 
I'm seeing contrast flowing. You a lot of times it's kind of slow flowing within the bile, but you'll you know eject enough just to make out the the form of the gallbladder, you know, but not mm -hmm. hyper injecting because just like with a neph tube or sure. biliary tube, you can cause sepsis, right? Right. Uh, Rikers. Um, Rikers. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which I had um, that happen the other uh, a couple of weeks ago with a a uh, liver abscess. I remember you were talking about that, and um, you know it was a nasty liver abscess. But as soon as I drained it, they developed rigors. So they give developed them some bacteremia pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. You did give Demerol. I always say yeah. like I've, I've had it happen. I'll say let's give some Demerol, and we never have Demerol anywhere close. So like oh, we got to get it from the pharmacy. It'll take an hour. Well, I think well. that's what happened to us. And I was yeah. just, and, and, and then like within five minutes, they went away, you know? Exactly. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. By the time you're able to get the dimmer already, um, right. it's already, uh, it's already right. resolved. Um, but it still is, it's kind of unnerving if you haven't yeah. seen it before. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, walk through the next step. So you have access, you injected, you're in, you're putting oh, hold your on. I did want to, oh. I did want to say earlier on when, or there, uh, there are some times when people are asking me to do a cholecystostomy tube and there's a lot of push and it's, and it's smart doctors disagreeing ab about whether or not the patient has cholecystitis, right? Um, I will sometimes get a little bit more aggressive with my contrast injection. Mm. And if I have a patent cystic duct, it's cholangiogram and I'm done. Yeah. Um, and that is very much the exception. 95 plus percent of the time, if I'm, if I'm injecting contrast, it's very much like you that I'm just looking to see that I'm in gallbladder lumen and I'm just using it. Uh, just to then kind of guide where my uh, wire goes and so and do you so when you inject and if you see a patent cystic duct then are you just you pull everything out and you're done you're like pull hey, everything out done yeah, they don't have yeah. cholecystitis right um, I've kind of softened on that because um, I, I know the the phys pathophysiology should be that like you have an obstructed cystic duct and if you have an obstructed cystic duct that's like what leads to the blockage and the cholecystitis um, but I don't know I I I wish that I was like a super smart guy and like, you know, researched all the information on cholecystostomy tubes, but I feel like there can be like kind of this like chronic uh, inflammation of the gallbladder with like poorly emptying like gallbladder ejection fractions in patients who are like ICU, yeah. like bed down, like they calculus cholecystitis where you may actually have a patent cystic duct. Right. Um, I don't want to go too far on a limb and say that and someone's like, oh, that's, it's either patent cystic duct or nothing. I just, I used to be kind of binary about it, but now I, I'm a little bit more flexible in that. Um, yeah. I'm just less interested in seeing whether the cystic duct is patent. So I've kind of moved towards you, I guess. I gotcha. I gotcha. Um, all right. So, uh, you got your wire, you coiled your wire into the gallbladder and then what's next that you, you dilate and are you using the eight or 10 French drain? I don't use eight for anything. I use eight. Like I usually if someone's trying to hit me an eight, I'll say eight is for air. And then I'll say, give me a 10 French. <laughs> I don't put eights. I don't put eights in anything. Uh, really? Unless it, unless I mean a pneumo. That's why I say eight is for air. Yeah. Um. It's 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 almost always like a ten French, coli tube. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um. I just put eight French nephrostomy tubes uh, in last week, just because the anatomy was like goofy, and I, I wanted to stay slow, you know, low profile, and it wasn't like frank purulent urine. It was just it was for diverting flow. Sure. So it was like. Clear urine is going to be okay with through an eight French. You know what I mean? I think, but, yes, I think that's totally fine. I just think the difference between an eight French and a 10 French is pretty small. And for some reason, like I just, in my, in our practice, um, we place a lot of 16 French tubes for different things, super pubics, yeah, abscesses, right. um, uh, some chest tubes, not for pneumo, but for like complex, uh, effusions. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. We we play so many sixteen French tubes that then I go and grab an eight French tube. And I'm just like, oh, so like nothing, like nothing. Yeah, right. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And we even have six French tubes that some of my partners use for different things. And yeah, like the that just seems like absurdly small. But right, you know, I think right. I think people do get away with it. Like, there's a guy in town who does six French cholecystostomy tubes, and he trocars in. Yeah, um, and and that's fine. It just to me, they just I just reserve eight French for just anything like pneumothorax and whatever yeah. else you might be draining um, that has just air and then 10 French and up for everything else. Like, yeah, I like the 10 tubes, French too. Tubes. Yeah, 10 French is good because, you know, if they're infected and that bile is like thick and it looks like yeah, oil. Yeah, bile is thick, yes. So you got to have a 10 French, otherwise it's just going to get clogged. Um, yeah. Real quick, before we talk about drainage, um, what do you, do you, do you, have you ever used a trocar for 
koi tubes? I've never trocard in uh, to a gallbladder, and I probably would not. And I yeah. and I very much in, do like to trocard into things, yeah. um, but I don't think I would do it for. And, and, no, I know I wouldn't do it for a cholecystostomy tube. Part of it's negativity bias. Like I remember very vividly in a uh, fellowship, we had a uh, M and M for someone who was trying to trocar in. Actually, he was trying to trocar in under CT, which to me seemed like a doubly yeah. bad idea. Right. Um, but trying to trocar into the gallbladder, it kind of just did not go well, and the patient ended up dying. No, mm. super, very, very sick patient, but it kind of stuck with me. Yeah. Um, and I, so I would, I would not do that. Yeah. I, I just, to me, it's like ultrasound guidance. You, it's just so much safer to do it um, with selling or technique. Yes. I, I don't know why you wouldn't. I mean, yeah. I'm just I, not why, that big why do you need to save five minutes to trocar? I, I, I mean, right. A, a, a coli tube that goes smoothly takes literally 10 minutes. Yeah. If that. And so, what am I saving time wise to do a trocar, which, as you said, has only downside, which is complications? Yeah, to um, be fair, there, there's probably a little bit of upside. Like, I, I think the times that I've sheared, like I've pushed through the gallbladder, it's during the dilation process. And so, yeah. like, I think if, like, you had, like, I, for if you have a certain skill set, you got a really stable situation where, like, you're just lasered in on the gallbladder. Like, I, not, I wouldn't fault someone for trocarring in. Um, I, I like to trocar into things. like the And also, like, whenever you're dilating, that's always, like, the biggest pain for the patients true um where you're dilating up and so if you can just like save them that and just like get them very numb like up to the liver capsule and then just go straight in i get that like i i, I think there's something to it but i like you i just think the the risk outweigh the the pros like you said like it's selling your technique tried and true yeah but i mean that's the thing is like when you have that wire in you you don't you you can dilate over that wire. you have a trend you have a track to dilate over whereas trocarring in you still got to shove that thing it's a ken french directly into the gallbladder mm -hmm. right yeah so you gotta have a backstop and again with the gallbladder being all floppy and stuff i don't know i just never could i never now granted i've never tried it and i know it was used primarily at bedside right for bedside placement mm -hmm. i've never had to do a bedside um you know to me it's just like we have the imaging guidance available let's do it the safest possible way and so that's that's why that's why i've never tried it now i know people get trained that way um but now ultrasound things imaging is a lot more accessible than it used to be so sure it might just be generational um, i don't know yeah no i mean I, one like so one i totally agree with you but i also um can see where if you have some experience with it you know that it works for you like i wouldn't fault someone for saying oh i trocar in every time and like i don't have a problem with it and i know if yeah. i you know hit this part of the gallbladder or if it's like really distended i'm i'm betting people are not trying to trocar into like those gallbladders where you know the the it's like the icu patients when they're kind of like it's the gallbladder walls thicken but like it's not as distended as you would like right um i run into those uh from time to time i, I bet you people are or different docs are probably not trocaring into that uh, yeah. that's my guess okay and then uh last thing i want to talk about is uh drainage bag or jp ball which way do you go with cold cystostomy tubes to gravity every time hmm interesting you do jp ball yeah and i'll tell you why because that okay. bile is super thick and infected and i want to get it out i want i went there needs to be some vacuum to pull all that infected fluid out. If it's just to a drainage bag, I feel like it's more likely to clog. The, 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 the drain itself is more likely to get clogged. That's my take on it. Now, I, would, I don't have I would science love, behind it, but. Right. I would love to get the Twitter IR's opinion on this. I just assumed yeah. everyone was doing what I was doing. I, I never gave it a second thought. Like when you put that on the outline, like JP versus gravity, I'm like, yeah. I was like, oh, is this a straw man? Everyone does gravity. <laughs> But what is the, yeah, but like, that's the thing is a text would always hand me the drainage bag. I'm like, no, give me a bulb. Because to me, it's just like any other infected space. I mean, other than like neft tubes, but there's a lot more pressure with the kidney pushing urine out through the tube. The gallbladder doesn't have that same kind of pressure, right? It's occluded. So you got to have something that's going to pull that fluid out. Otherwise, all that sediment and and stuff it's that, 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 the, the, the pigtail sitting in is going to lead to it getting clogged. And that, that's my whole, now it's just, 
I don't have any science behind it, but I just feel like it's more likely to get clogged if you just, if you don't have pressure pulling it out. I don't think my cholecystostomy tubes are getting clogged very often. Uh, okay. I think, I think like standard drain care, like, you know, we still flush it BID or, you know, yeah. I don't flush it, but nurse, nurses are flushing it BID. You put BID. orders in to flush it BID? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I just, I, I think I have five like Five cc's? I think it says five to 10 cc's. Like it's now like kind of an epic order set where like I just, it's actually a dot phrase for a nursing communication. Um, yeah. But um, my thought was always that, you know, you don't need to pull it out because the gallbladder is contracting. And so it's just going to go the path of least resistance. And if the cystic duct is clogged, then it's going to push it out into mm-hmm. this big open tube. Um, and also like when, so I, I wouldn't have a problem doing a JP bowl, but when they go home, like say they fully recover, you know, it's the ICU cholecystostomy case that like, you know, fully recovers and is going home, but they're going home with a tube in. Um, are you still going to have it to a JP bulb? Yeah. A JP bulb you can put in your pocket. Whereas the bag is like, it's a whole, di- you know, like where do you put the bag? It can't fit in their pants. It's mm-hmm. got to sit on the exterior. So I, I feel like the patient appreciates the JP bulb more as well. That might be true. Um, I always thought that, or my line of thinking was that, you know, at some point, you know, it's very possible that the, the cystic duct opens up or whatever they had going on in the ICU has kind of uh, relaxed and, and some, like, you know, like sometimes you do Coley checks. I mean, that's the whole point of doing the Coley check is like you put the dye in then you have, all of a sudden you have a patent cystic duct. And so having like a gravity bag allows that uh, bile to have like a choice, like, Hey, I can still go in the bag, but you know, if the cystic duct is open, like I'm going <laughs> to, yeah. I'm going to flow the anatomical route. And in yeah. fact, in, in uh, med school, like this kind of stuck with me, but I, I didn't do it in residency or a uh, fellowship the IR doc would have the patients uh, wear their gravity bag high, like on their shoulder. And the idea was that like the path of least resistance, um, he wanted to push it more towards the cystic duct. Oh, okay. Huh, that's interesting. Yeah, because then that way pressure like, is building up to, to, to clear it out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe there's a paper out there about this. I've I have yet to see it, but if anybody in the audience uh, knows of any science behind this, like it's like a myth buster, um, maybe we could, we could I, solve I, it. I suspect it's one of these things that all roads kind of lead to the same place. Um, right. That right. my cholecystostomy tube checks aren't having like any higher <laughs> degrees of patency with the cystic duct than yours are. Yeah. Um, I think like if I had to guess, my into, my gut says that uh, either either one will work well. Yeah. Well, um, on a scale of one to 10, where do cholecystostomy tubes sit on your least favorite to favorite procedures? Uh, you know, I, I'm pretty neutral towards cholecystostomy tubes. Like I'm, I'm not for them or against them. Uh, <laughs> like I would, I would say five because like sometimes, you know, I can see myself like complaining about a cholecystostomy tube and who like, sometimes I think like, the gallbladder is just like this culprit who like when no one knows what's going on, it's like all of a sudden someone's like, maybe it's the gallbladder. And then all of a sudden everyone hates the gallbladder and everyone's like, it's got to be the gallbladder. And people are clamoring for like the gallbladder's got to come out or we need a cholecystostomy tube. Right. And it's it's like a, it's like a crowd that like a mob crowd that all of a sudden everyone's going wild against the gallbladder. And sometimes like I feel like I'm, I'm fighting an uphill battle to like, all right, well, let's just take a step back. There's a lot of reasons someone can have sepsis. The gallbladder is one of many. Um, and so like, I always like to take a beat and say like, you know, let's not put in this like emergently, let's do the work up, make sure it's appropriate, Mm -hmm. um, weigh the risk, weigh the benefits. Um, and, but at the same time, there are patients that, I mean, it does make a, it clearly makes a huge difference in, and you know, it's, if it's a source of sepsis, you know, you gotta get it, uh, gotta get the cholecystostomy tube done. Yeah. For me, there's somewhere around a five or six, I think. It mostly, I like. Six I don't would mind. imply that you're you're uh, you're for it in some way, like like you're well, like, oh, well, cholecystostomy tubes on the schedule, that's going to be good. Well, it's it's just that like they're. I find them kind of satisfying because the patients do get better, and like you're. Yeah. I mean, there's there was a surgeon who was like, hey man, you helped save this person's life. They were really sick, and I couldn't take the col, you know, the gallbladder out. And so in that that sense, it's very satisfying. I just they tend to be like always at the end of the day. It's always like three p.m. consult, like. Hey, we really want to get this, you know, coli tube in before tomorrow. And you're like, okay, we'll just tack it on at the end. So I always feel like they're like late afternoon cases. And that's, 
That's why I'm not like a seven or an eight. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I can, I can sympathize with that. I would say yeah. one, if the surgeon ever told me, Hey, you made a big difference. And like, you know, we saved this guy, I would say, duh, I would say, duh, just like all my other procedures. <laughs> and, uh, I guess the other thing is, um, you know, I'm not a lot of times I'm not in a hurry to, you know, if a patient truly is septic and, and needs an emergently, you know, I will certainly spring into action emergently. Like if someone consults me at 3 PM and they're like, Hey, we'd really like to get this done. Like I always offer it. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I always offer to see the patient or like I make it my point to see the patient before I'm done with the day, but their acuity level, just because they're in the ICU does not mean like, I, I feel like it's an emergency to get it done. Yeah. Um, and I, and I'm not going to stress our resources, um, just because they kind of like treaded water from like a large part of the day than to consult me at three o'clock. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, but, but I do think that, you know, it's like, it behooves like other interventionalists, like have a clinical practice, be able to see the patient weigh in. If, if you're just mad about the 3 PM consult and you're going to kind of like, you know, kick rocks around, then, you know, you just got to go see the patient, decide whether it's appropriate or not. And I think like you'll get a lot more job satisfaction in knowing that the person that you're doing at 5 p.m. is because they're sick and they deserve a cholecystostomy tube, not because like someone consulted you late. Right, right. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, I think that was a pretty good discussion of cholecystostomy tubes. Chris, anything we left out? I wanted to talk real, real quick about antibiotics, like what you do oh, for antibiotics. Yeah. Um, well, usually by the time they've caught, they, they already have them hanging, usually. I don't, so how I'm not this? giving antibiotics. Okay. How about this? So, I mean, they're almost always on antibiotics. I mean, it's the yeah. exception rather than the rule that they're not. Um, but what if they've had antibiotics, like you're doing the case at noon and they had antibiotics at like 6 a.m. Do you still try and give a dose um, right before you, like within an hour of sick time? No, because they're already on some sort of antibiotic regimen. Um, you know, the, at that point, you know, they're, they're admitted or they've gone to the, the ER and they've made a decision, this patient's septic or they're, they're sick, they have cholecystitis and somebody's already started them on antibiotics. So I've literally, I mean, not, you know, unlike maybe a NEF tube or something like that, I've never said, Hey, hang the antibiotics. Cause usually they're already ordered or hanging already. That's fair. I will usually try and time my procedures where like if they have like a dose that's coming up, I'll hold that dose to where we give it within an hour of like me sticking the gallbladder. Oh, okay. And if they don't, I might actually give them a boost of like whatever like appropriate antibiotic, maybe, whether, maybe it's one that they're on or maybe it's just like a gram of Rocephin, like within an hour of my stick. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm curious about um, what other people do. Yeah, so when we put this one out, I am going to pull the uh, Twitter verse on a couple of these things. This will be fun because it'll be kind of easy, like UE versus Agustic, you know, through the liver or not. So we could do CT versus ultrasound. We could do um, drainage back versus JP bulb. We could, there's a number of different polls we can throw out on social media. Sure. And, uh, and then around the time of this release. So uh, I'm looking forward to the feedback. Yeah. Oh, you also mentioned bedside cholecystostomy tubes. Um, yeah. You haven't done any bedside? I have not. I have not. Um, I mean, I guess if there was some extreme case where the lab was shut down, CT was shut down, mm -hmm. you know, apocalyptic, you know, situation <laughs> where I sure it needed to be a bedside, yeah. uh, then I would, I would do it. But I, you know, I, I, I think ultrasound slash fluoro is essential and my second you know secondly i would do ct if if necessary but i've never had i've never nobody's ever asked me to do a bedside i don't, I don't know why i would we've been we've been asked like a lot of times we get pushed back when we're like yeah hey, we got to take them to cath lab and they're like can't you just do it bedside and hmm. um i don't even what well, one i i would if i thought the patient was truly unstable and like a transfer would you know potentially kill them but uh, so I have done a couple of bedsides, um, but 99% of the time I'm going to push for them also to be in the lab only because I, I think it's, if, the, if it's appropriate, I think you sometimes can have a, like a, a very like routine procedure. But if you like strip away all your resources and put yourself in like, you know, your non-comfort zone, if bedside is your comfort zone, then, you know, go for it, more power to you. But um, it's certainly not mine and certainly not where all our resources yeah. are available to us. And so I'm very much, I want to do it where, you know, I, I kind of, I just tell the referring docs, it's usually pulmonologists or intensivists that 
I'm like, you know, this is a procedure. It's almost like a surgery. And, you know, you're not going to ask a surgeon to operate in here. Sometimes they'll right. push back and they oh, sometimes like the surgeons do operate in, you know, the, the ICU settings and, you know, tertiary referral centers. But um, I'm like, no, I just need all all my equipment, my team, like the patient, you know, everyone yeah. who knows like how to put in a cholecystostomy tube. It's not just me. It's a team approach. Right. I think that's fair. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess if they're like super sick and they can't, like you said, they can't travel to the lab or to CT uh, and they're pushing hard, but that's yet happened to me. Knock on wood. Hope it never does. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, sounds good. Well, uh, thank you everybody for listening. Uh, looking forward to putting this one out and, uh, looking forward to the, the feedback. Thank you for listening to the Back Table Podcast.